Let's see one of the important physical features of your disk that on your surface there's a heat balance. And to take care of this heat balance, nature has certain processes which are very important in making our living planet. So let's first see what is the heat balance and then what are the kinds of mechanisms which are related to it. You know from previous lecture and from your school also that sun in one year's time moves between the two tropics that 23 and a half degrees north and 23 and a half degrees south these are the farthest limits of the vertical rays of the sun that sun maximum reaches 23 and a half and these lines are called as parallels but then you also understand that when sun is going in the sky towards the tropic of cancer the areas which are little north of Tropic of Cancer and the areas which are little south of Tropic of Capricorn, even they will get some good amount of heat. So, scientists today discover that on the earth, between approximately 35 degrees north and 35 degrees south, in this area of the world, There is a surplus of heat. Those are writing they can write after five minutes. Just follow the book. In this age of the world, there is a clear surplus of heat. The reason being that in these areas of the world, the insulation, did I use the word insulation? Yes. Incoming solar radiation. And the other word I'll use today is out radiation. See here, in the coming classes we'll see that Earth gets energy from the Sun and X as a very good radiator. So it means there are two things. The Sun gives us energy and second, Earth out radiates that energy. And later you'll be told a very important fact of nature that our atmosphere is primarily heated not by the direct rays of sunlight, but it is primarily heated by us out radiation. Because you have learned in school science that majority of the insulation which comes to the earth, it is in the form of short wavelengths. And our gases of the atmosphere are not good in absorbing those short wavelengths. So there is not much heating of the earth's atmosphere by direct sunlight. But when the earth as a body gets the heat, it out radiates that energy and most of that out radiation is in the form of long wavelengths and our gases of the atmosphere are very good in absorbing long wavelengths. <coughs> now today I don't need that point of atmosphere that will be relevant later later but today you just understand there are two things one what we get from the sun that is the insulation and then what we radiate out so there are two terms insulation and out radiation. Insulation is like my army, out radiation is like, like my expenditure. So, scientists have discovered that between 35 degrees north and 35 degrees south, approximately, the insulation is much, much more than the out radiation. It means these are, these are the areas like the rich families of India, where earnings are always more than the expenditures, and there is always a surplus at home. But when we go beyond from 35 degrees north to north pole and 35 degrees south to south pole, we find that these areas of the world have a clear deficit of energy or deficit of heat. And the same here that you have clear deficit of heat here. And the reason being, the out radiation is more than, means my expenditures are more than my earnings. So tell me, is that topic being seen in the diagram now? That on the earth surface, that is a global heat imbalance. There are surplus areas and there are deficit areas. But there would be some students in the class who would have immediately questioned the mind that how come an area can 
how should we react more than what we perceive? Is that anyone having that question? Yeah. Now, some students are saying yes. So those who have this question that how come an area can lose more than what it receives, I would say that if you go for five, ten minutes more, you will see it is all possible. But those who don't want to wait, let me give a parallel analogy from human life and then I'll come back to nature because there's a correspondence I see in human society and nature. Now please see here. Excuse me, if you write, then you'll not listen to me. No? Two things can't be done together. Books also have the same. I didn't mention it at all. So what is it for other things? Focus here, I always say, first listen to me, and second is I feel neglected. <laughs> I want your attention. Yeah. Now, so we have already also. <laughs> now I'll give you some parallel analogy. Think of your economics classes. Either you would have done it by now, or you'll be doing it throughout your course. That India's planning has been always <laughs> deficit planning. Have you come across this one? <laughs> your economics teacher will tell you again and again by dealing with Indian economy that our revenue collection has always been less than our <laughs> And still see, they still promise Ajay Binani. <laughs> this is Gandhi used to do that slogan, Gravy or the This economy has been done for so long, we have survived as a nation, despite huge population and all that. And despite the fact that revenue collection has been less than Now why? How is it possible? How can Indian economy, how can the government, the party in power, can spend more than what it collects? Because there are mechanisms. RBI has certain mechanisms. You will be studying about bonds and many other things which the government can go for. And there are ways out. So I say at this moment, Indian economy can spend more than what it collects in revenue because there are certain mechanisms. Second example from your life. Tell me, me or your parents, can we all spend today more than what we are? It is very much possible. No, every day we get messages from different kind of agencies that come and take this big car even if you don't need it. <laughs> and you can pay us later. Take a bigger home than what you live in and you can pay us later. So it means today an individual also has mechanisms available there he or she can spend more than what, what he or she earns as such. So it means mechanisms can make it possible. Similarly, you will see something happening here also. Now, before I go into that, let me make one more observation. Imagine for a moment that this was the only picture of nature. That the lower latitudes were saving more energy than what they were outradiating. And higher latitudes, middle and higher latitudes, were out radiating more than what they received. If this was the only scenario, don't you think these areas would have become with time hotter and hotter? Like people become richer and richer. And these areas would have become ever colder. And you know, extreme coldness and extreme heat would not make the life possible. So it means Earth would not have been a living planet if this was the only scenario. But so it means Mother Nature has done something. So see here, Mother Nature has generated certain mechanisms, both in the atmosphere as well as in the oceans. For example, very soon you will be studying with me the winds in the atmosphere. You will be studying cyclones with one of us. The anti-cyclones, you will study monsoons of India and number of other cyclones. In the oceans, we will study many mechanisms, like for example, ocean currents. Current. You will find one thing, all these mechanisms have one common pursuit. Means in every lecture of mine, when I deal with this or other teacher deals with these topics of the circulations of atmosphere and the circulations of oceans, you will find there is one common attempt in all of them. What is that attempt? Now mind this statement of mine, Mother Nature through these mechanisms is always a trying to moderate, means to lessen this global heat imbalance by transferring 
the surplus of heat from these lower to higher latitudes and transferring the coldness from higher to lower. And remember, I'm using the word Mother Nature moderates this heat imbalance. It means nature doesn't go for attempt to eliminate this difference. Because at the end of the day, we still know that even if there are transfers of energy between the lower and higher latitudes, we still find the lower latitudes are warmer and higher latitudes are colder. And that differential heating on the earth's surface, you will see in ecology classes, is one major reason for nature to be so full of diversity. Means, can I say, you, you have understood by your studies of nature in school and college, that one principle which puts apart the nature in a distinct way is almost everywhere, almost everywhere, nature's principle is <laughs> that there are hundreds and thousands of species of flora and fauna. The reason you will understand is that nature gets stronger if there is more diversity. So nature chose diversity as a principle through the differential heading because diversity brings resilience in nature. Those ecosystems which are more diverse, they are more they are therefore much stronger than others as such. And if someone asks you in one word, <coughs> now think of this point, that if someone asks you in one word, what damage man has done to the nature, or what man has done to the nature, in one simple word, the answer would be, the best answer would be, that man has simplified nature. Think of it. And this is the greatest damage man has done. That nature's principle was, Diversity. diversity. Man went there and removed the diversity. For example, there was a forest. Forest <laughs> represents a multiculture. Man goes there, removes the forest, and grows only a one crop called rice or one crop called wheat. And we call it as monoculture. At the moment you do monoculture, you have the system becoming fragile. And then to save that system, you need chemicals like insecticides, pesticides, and fertilizers, etc. Think of Punjab, think of Haryana. We have green revolution areas which are saving us today in terms of output being very large, but they are, they are, they are, they are the ecosystems which are very, very We have damaged nature there. So it means nature's principle was moderation of this imbalance for the reason of okay. Now, before we write this point, as an approximation, scientists tell us that whatever heat transfers take place on the earth's surface, 80% of that heat transfer is by atmospheric circulations and 20% is by oceanic circulations. Now, in all my coming classes or other teachers of geography, when we teach these all topics, you'll find every particular topic we do would show you that there's some attempt of transfer of energy. I can show you today in two minutes by taking the example of ocean currents. What is ocean current? The top surface layer of the ocean. Imagine the core is the depth of the ocean. The first 100 meters of ocean water is referred to as surface layer of the ocean. And you will see very soon I'll be taking two lectures on ocean currents. You will find that this surface layer of the ocean, the water moves from one area to another. And there are two major types of currents, warm and cold currents. So you'll find there are currents going from lower to higher latitudes. And they take energy of the lower to higher latitudes. For example, you'll find there is a big current called North Atlantic Drift, which goes towards the west coast of Europe from the lower latitudes. And as a result, West Europe is very mild in winter as compared to Central Europe. Means London as a city is not very severe in winter, but if you go to a city in Germany, you will find winter will be very cold. cold. And you might have read in school books that the Northern European countries, their poor cities are able to function even in winter. The reason is same. The same warm water goes to the Northern European countries and that little warm water doesn't let the water of that area freeze during winter and poor cities are able to function in winter season. But in the same latitudes, the cities, the poor cities of Canada and US, they are not able to function 
because they are visited by a very cold current which is called Labrador. So it's a clear example that heat is being taken from lower to higher and the coldness is being drawn from higher to lower. This is not only done by oceans, it will be done by all winds of the world as well as the other phenomena you have heard of, cyclones, thunderstorms, tornadoes and so on. In fact, whatever you study would have this common motion. And this is what helps us to, or what gets us the living planet. So recite a few lines here. Recite between, first point, between approximately 35 degrees north and 35 degrees south, there is a surplus of energy. There is a surplus of energy <coughs> because insulation exceeds because insulation exceeds out radiation because insulation exceeds out radiation <coughs> second point Cold words, second word is cold words from 35 degrees north, cold words from 35 degrees north and 35 degrees south, there is a deficit of energy, <coughs> there is a deficit of energy because out radiation exceeds because out radiation exceeds insulation. Out radiation exceeds insulation. Next point. Theoretically, theoretically, such an imbalance. Theoretically, such an imbalance in energy distribution theoretically such an imbalance in energy distribution could result in could result in the lower latitudes becoming the lower latitudes becoming warmer, the lower latitudes becoming warmer and the higher latitudes becoming ever colder and the higher latitudes becoming ever colder. Full stop, right? In reality, however, next sentence, same point. In reality, comma, however, again a comma. In reality, however, energy is transferred Energy is transferred from areas of surplus, from areas of surplus to areas of deficit, areas of surplus to areas of deficit in two related ways, in two related ways. Would you have a right? Atmospheric circulations, number one, atmospheric circulations, and when you write atmospheric circulations, again that you write about 80% of heat transfer, about 80% of heat transfer, and second right, by oceanic circulations, by oceanic circulations or oceanic circulations and right within brackets about 20% of heat transfer about 20% of heat transfer
see a big enough sketch. Now please write next title. Great surprise. You see, this concept of gray circle comes from mathematics, but has its applications in our geometry classes. And this concept is a relation to a spherical body, a sphere. So I take around 15 minutes to deliver this topic. So please go right and you are good, you will write it See here, to explain the concept of gray circle for a given sphere, I take the root apple as a spherical body. Well, I know it's not a sphere, but let's assume. So imagine there's an apple with you and you have a knife in the other hand. So take knife to be a plane and the apple to be a sphere. Now, whenever you run the knife through the apple anywhere to cut it into two parts, can I say the intersection of the knife, the plane, and the surface of the apple will always give you a circle? I repeat one more. If I take a, uh, if I take an apple to be a sphere, and you have a knife with you, knife you take as a plane, whenever you run the plane through the apple anywhere to cut it into two parts, two pieces, then the intersection of the knife and the surface of the apple, the sphere, will always give us a circle. Yes or no? Yes. Now, second point. If I run the knife through the center of the sphere, the center of the apple, to cut it into two pieces, can I say, in that case, the intersection of the knife and the surface of the apple, the surface of the sphere, will give me the largest circle for that sphere? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I say this larger circle? will divide my sphere into two exact halves. <coughs> Can I also say that this larger circle will give me the circumference of the sphere? Yes, yes sir. Such larger circle is what science calls as a great circle for a given sphere. So it means a great circle is a circle <coughs> which I get when I run a plane through the center of the sphere. And it divides the sphere into two exact halves. And it also represents the circumference of that sphere. If you understand this, please tell me how many great circles are possible for a given sphere? One. Improve your answer. Answer is infinite. At which there can be infinite great circles for a given sphere. Those who said one, imagine if you have one apple. You can run the knife through the apple, through the center, in 
n number of different ways, yes or no? Infinite number of ways. Means if you really want to get a great circle for a given sphere like apple, the only thing you have to ensure is that knife should pass through the center. And you can do it in n number of different ways. You can put the knife horizontal, you can put it vertical, and you can put it at any other angle. The only thing you have to ensure is it passes through the <laughs> So, there are infinite great circles possible for a given sphere. Let's have one more concept for a sphere. As we have a great circle, there's one more concept for a spherical body, and that is a small circle. What is small circle? See, if there is a sphere like happen, if I run the knife through any point other than the center, you know, wherever you run the knife through the apple, to cut into two pieces, we get the intersection to be a circle. So when I run the knife through any point other than the center, then the circle which I get will be called as small circle. Now just to make it easier, recall that day when you had one apple and you had to share it with your younger brother or sister. You said, I'll the other, I'll cut it. So you took the apple, you took the knife, and you showed to the younger brother or sister that, see, I'm putting it right at the center, so that we equal share. And you did that. But the moment you were about to cut, you did this. You have to lift it up or lift it down. And it means you got what? So that is the difference between the two Now, if this is all understood, let's apply it to our previous lecture. And then I'll apply it to my future class also. Means this is a mathematical concept, but it has its relevance in geography classes. Now, first I relate it to my previous lecture where I taught you parallels and meridians. Now, can I say, doing this topic today, that out of all the parallels of the globe, equator alone makes a great circle. All parallels, other than the equator, will always make small circles. Clear? Now, let's think of meridians. I make a statement just agree or disagree with this. If this is the globe, I draw one meridian. You know, meridian is a line during North Pole and South Pole on the surface of the Earth. So, can I say each meridian will make a semi great circle? By semi, I mean half of a great circle. So, whenever you make any meridian, for example, you make zero degree meridian, what is that? Greenwich meridian. So, you join North Pole to South Pole, passing through Greenwich. Now, can I say this meridian or any other meridian? Will always give me half of a great circle. And that half is called as a semi great circle. Yes or no? Yes. Now, when you read some school book today on this topic, like GCE or some other book, you will find authors in their books generally write all meridians make great circles. Now, I would say better statement is that each meridian makes semi great circle. But when school books for school children simplify, they say, all meridians make great circles. It means the author is assuming that for every meridian I can, I can take the counterpart also. For example, if I take Greenwich meridian and the counterpart would be, remember 180 degrees meridian, the international gate line. So if I take both of them together, they will always make a great circle. So, what is the conclusion for our previous topic? Equator is the only parallel making great circle. All other parallels other than the equator are making small circles. And all meridians make great circles. Or you may say, better statement, each meridian makes a semi great circle or half of a great circle. Is that fine? Now, this particular topic has its relevance in a future class also. I have already given a hint about one lecture which I will be taking perhaps in my ninth or 10th class with you. I said I will be taking a lecture on reasons for seasons. seasons. Okay. Now, a little reflection of this I have given you earlier. Today I will give you a little more reflection of this topic, but the topic will be done in details later later. So let me show you that nature, now mind this point, nature has given us a very good example of great circle. Let's understand what it is, but before that, let's add one point for seasonality. Can I say, we all understand seasonality by changing length of the day, did I say this up here? <coughs> See, summer is a time when the days are 
longer and the winters in time and days are shorter. So, length of the day gives us what we understand as seasonality. Now, we will understand the details of this topic of seasonality in the lecture on reasons for seasons, where I will show you that there are some five reasons in the nature which cause seasonality. But since it's my ninth or tenth lecture, I will not give you the reasons today. I have not prepared. <laughs> I, when, I'm, and when I have that ninth lecture, I'll come prepared. I'll give you some reasons. So today, I will not talk about reasons, but I'll talk about the results called seasonality. And I'll make your that lecture, ninth lecture, easier today by giving one concept. See here. Today, for the next five minutes, I will ask you to think of Earth as an apple. And you know, apple can be cut in n number of different ways by a knife into two halves. Yes, isn't it? So nature has given us a knife. Now, that knife is what gives us the result called? What is that knife? Let's see. See, as earth revolves around the sun in one year's journey, at every moment of this journey, sun illuminates always one half of the earth. I repeat, as earth revolves around the sun, at every moment of this journey of one year, the sun will always illuminate exact one half of the earth. So it means there are two halves of the earth, light half and the dark half. So imagine for this moment that if my hand is the earth and the part towards you is the light half, or I may call it in my notes, sunlit hemisphere means hemisphere which is getting light from the sun. So if this is the light half or the sunlit hemisphere and my the, the part of the hand which is towards me is the dark half. So if this is light half and this is dark half, now look at what I say. Can I say the edge, the edge of the sunlit hemisphere, the edge of the light half, can I say would be a great circle? Yes. Yes, please? Yes. This great circle, science calls as circle of illumination. So nature has given us a very beautiful example of great circle and that is called as circle of illumination. So when I come to teach you the topic of seasonality, reasons will be told later, you will find that this circle of illumination will act like a knife. And we'll cut the apple, that is earth, in n number of different ways, but always into two, two halves. So, I give you a crux statement for that lecture of seasonality, which we'll use later. Means if you remember this statement, then that lecture of seasonality will be understood today only, without the details as such. So see, as earth revolves around the sun in one year's time, because of some reasons which are not disclosing today, the relationship between the earth and sun will keep changing. By relationship I mean the orientation of my planet earth with respect to the sun will keep changing. But circle of illumination, being a great circle, will always divide the earth into two halves. But since the relationship is changing, it will do so differently at different times of the year. Try to understand this statement. This will tell you how we get changing length of the day. I repeat, as earth revolves around the sun in a year's time, because of some reasons, the relationship between the earth and sun keeps changing. The circle of illumination, being a great circle, will always divide one into two halves. But since the relationship is changing, the circle of illumination will divide the earth into two halves differently at different times. And since it cuts the earth into two halves differently at different times, that gives you the changing. Now, those who are not getting this, I'll give you one or two illustrations which perhaps I have given earlier also while giving you those important parables. Now, did I use it on solstice with you? Yes. Yes. You know, solstice is the day when the sun is reaching its highest position in northern and southern hemisphere. And then you have two days called equinoxes, when the sun is overhead at the equator. And you know, these are two days. One in March and the other is in September. Now, I'll give you one or two examples here. 
of the same days, and then you will understand what I am saying as the circle of illumination will cut by a into two halves always, but different yet. Different times. Now let me recall one particular day, like 22nd December. So take this marker to be the Earth's axis. Axis you understand? And imagine the line joining North Pole and South Pole passing to the center. And imagine a globe around it. So imagine this track, this marker, and around it there is a globe and meet the sun. On 22nd December, if the sun is here, let me the sun is here, and earth is so placed. Did I show you this up here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Which hemisphere is towards the sun? Southern. 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 Northern hemisphere is away. On 22nd December, approximately, sun will be overhead at Tropic of Capricorn. Capricorn, somewhere here, right? Now, take my left hand as circle of illumination. This circle of illumination will cut this earth like this. The farthest reach of the sun's rays will be up to Arctic Circle. So imagine my left hand is holding an apple, apple called earth, and there is a light, that is circle of illumination, acting like, like a knife. A knife is running through. Imagine the apple in the hand, and knife is going through Arctic Circle. Remember Arctic Circle? Yeah. Then through the center, and cuts it into two halves. Now it means there is a particular kind of cutting. Can I say in this cutting, by the light of the sun, the earth is getting longer lengths of the parallels in the southern hemisphere under light. Yes, please? Longer lengths of southern hemisphere under light means what? They are longer days. And you know, the summer is summer for oscillations. And since our hemisphere was away from the sun's rays, when the sun is cutting the earth through Arctic circle and then the center, then can I say shorter lengths of the parallels of northern, uh, northern hemisphere? Would be under sunlight, our days would be shorter. shorter. This is winter for us, right? Now, this is one kind of cutting on which date? 20 seconds. Now, Earth will go for its revolution around the sun. Every day, the relationship of the Earth and sun will keep changing. Every day, the changes will be very minor, so we'll not be able to understand much clearly. So, what I do is I show you a change after three months. When small changes would have accumulated to show you a clear difference now. So, Earth goes for one fourth of your orbit from December to March, January, February, March. And on 20th March, because of some reason which I have not mentioned today, Earth and Sun would be so placed. Now, please tell me where is the Sun overhead? Right at the equator. And circular illumination will act like a knife and cut through North Pole and so, it means apple on the table, knife going vertically down. So when the light, the circle of illumination, will cut through North Pole, then center, and then South Pole, can I say, every parallel of my planet will have half length under sunlight and half length under darkness. So we will get, for all places, equal length of the day and night. And that is what we call it as equinox. Now please tell me, in this cutting, do you notice Means, would you understand this point if I say that from December to March, people in Northern Israel, like the Indians, would have gained in the length of the day? Yes. Our days have become longer, and Australian days have become shorter. It's a signal for we Indians that we are approaching summer, and Australian signal is that we are approaching. So I hope now you can understand that as Earth goes around the sun, the relationship will keep changing. So it means basically, if I cut it short here, you need to understand nature has given us a great circle called circular illumination that acts like a knife, that cuts my earth like an apple in n number of different ways, but always into And since the relationship of earth and sun is always changing, so this, the circle of illumination cuts my earth differently at different times, but always into two hours. And that gives me the variation, the changing length of the period. And that is what humanity understands as humanity. Okay. Now, details of it will be there in the lecture of humanity. But today, I'm happy if you are still, and please, even if you have understood this much, that great circle is given by nature in the form of circle. Okay. So, this is what we like today. Now, one more point before I give you the notes on great circle. 
There is one mathematical property of great circle which is of great application to human society. Let's understand that property and then after that I'll give you the notes. This here. 